Happy Easter. Easter. All right, let's see if you remember. He is risen. risen Okay, all right. I'm going to give you a chance to do a little stronger than that. I want to thank everybody who made this renovation happen. You guys have worked tirelessly for six weeks, and we cannot thank you enough. Late, late nights, including late last night, making sure the paint was still dry. Anybody notice something new in front of me? This is not the same pulpit. Look close. This is purple right now. Someone goes, are you serious? The path to put purple? This is original purple heart wood. This is original walnut with scars on the back. I can't wait for you to see this with purple inlet. I want you to see. This was a surprise even to me. Last night I came in here and a 15-year-old Eli Woodard had built this. Can you believe that? 15 years old. <laughs> Incredible. I was still playing with Lincoln Logs and like Tinker Toys at 15. He's built up. Not one single screw or bolt, not even a piece of metal is in this. This whole thing is old school. So come up and take a look. It's got purple inlay that you can't see. I'm so fired up. I see the scars and I think about what Jesus did. Today we're talking about a brand new love. And when we think the words, he is risen, I'm reminded of a great story from a little girl named Margaret, and she's talking about her famous father, W.E. Sangster, and he was this great English-British-speaking pastor, missionary, uh, evangelist that was born in 1900. And everything was going along fine for the first 50 years of his ministry and the first 50 years of his life until it wasn't. At first, it was subtle. There was a few things that were starting to happen, a few little changes in his health. He thought, you know, I just got a little tickle in my throat, a little slight uneasiness. And I feel like my legs are weak and my arms just, they just feel so heavy. But he didn't think much of it, so he went on with this undiagnosed for years. Finally, when he started to drag his right leg and had trouble even standing to present the gospel, he agreed to go and do what men do, finally go see a doctor. And when he went to the doctor, the doctor said, I am so sorry to tell you, you have an incurable disease called progressive muscular atrophy. And from this moment forward, your muscles will continue to atrophy. And they will get worse and worse. And it will speed up. And it will be progressive. And it will begin with your legs completely going. Your muscles will wither away to nothing. And then your arms, your abdomen, all the way up to your throat. Eventually, it will affect your voice. And you won't even... What the death knell is, it takes away your muscular ability to swallow. And back in the 50s, that was pretty much a death sentence. Now, when this awesome, godly, humble servant heard the news, guess what his response was? He said, well, thankfully, I can still write about Jesus. And if I take my legs away and I can't move, then I will have even more time to be on my knees in prayer. That was his first response. Can you believe that? Who, who thinks like this? Then he would write this, Lord, please just let me stay in the struggle for you. I don't mind if I can no longer be a general used by you, but if you just give me a tiny regiment to lead, I will be happy. And when his legs became completely useless and his voice was gone, he threw himself into his work just writing and writing, even with shaking terrible hands. He wrote articles and books. Then he began to help organize prayer meetings all throughout England. Get this. Nothing in his failing body was going to stop him from declaring that he is risen. He devoted his life. I mean, think about the excuses we have in our country for not even telling our neighbor, for not even assembling together. And he said nothing will stop it. In fact, in his final letter to his daughter, it was Easter morning on a day just like today when he wrote this. It is a terrible thing to wake up on Easter morning and have no voice to shout, he is risen. But it would be still more terrible to have a voice and not want to shout it. Wow. That is incredible. Today we join with Christians all over the world. Some hiding out in catacombs. Some underground. Some literally in fear for their lives to celebrate the fact that he is risen. To celebrate the fact that we have a resurrected Savior. A love that conquered death. Today is Easter, but we also start a brand new series for the next four weeks called Love Reigns, and it is going to be life-changing. It is going to talk about the freedom of God's amazing love, transforming our past, breaking free of chains. If you have guilt and shame, don't miss next Sunday. 
Okay, that is when we are going to talk about how God's love frees us from the past, then our present, and then going on into the future. Because when you think about it, love transforms everything. It is the driving force behind any sacrificial motive. Think about this. Think about how much we underestimate the power of love. How many men do you know that did crazy things to woo the heart of their sweetie? How many stories can you think of? Men, you know. We do some whacked out stuff to try to impress that one, that one. To see. Guys, you remember when you first saw that young lady, the one who had become your wife? Man, I do. In fact, I didn't even ask her permission. I found a pic I've never been able to show before. A brand new photo of her senior year, right? I saw that. I was like, wow, I want to pray with her. I just, <laughs> I had very pure thoughts. I said, I just, we need to pray together. Seriously, because I saw her. It was in church. And I saw her and I said, what? Who? I tried to play it cool. I'm like, hey, who, who's, who's that girl over there on the, on the platform rehearsing that drama? They're like, oh, yeah, that's Amy. I'm like, hmm, that's cool. And I just played it off. For two more months, I tried to work up the courage. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, how in the world is that girl going to marry this guy right here? <laughs> Look at that. That's her senior pick and mine, right, put, put together. Love is powerful. Love makes you do crazy things. Love is a great motivating factor, and it is the motivating factor behind every great sacrificial movement. When you think about it, I, I read about a pastor who was struggling. He wanted so badly to meet this girl and who would eventually become his wife, but he went to this diner hoping she would wait on him, coming up to serve her. And every time he sat down, he would order food he didn't even want. And she would never be his server. She would always serve other tables, never assign. And finally, one day, he worked up his courage. He was so ready. And sure enough, he comes walking across, and she comes to his table and says, Hi, can I take your order? And he choked. Everything he thought of, think about this, because he loved so much, he just couldn't wait for this moment. Everything he thought of just went out the window. And he said, true story, the only thing he could think of was he held out his arm, and he goes, Hey, check out my spider bite. And he points to a wound on the arm. But it broke the ice, and it revealed a heart of love, and the rest is history. They got married, and they went on to have an incredible time. Love compels us to act. It is the driving force behind every great sacrificial action, whether it's your family, for your friends, or what we look at today. The most amazing, the ultimate sacrifice of love that we celebrate on Resurrection Day. Because before there was a resurrection, as hard as it is to think about, there was a sacrifice. A tough sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice. So go ahead and open your Bible to Matthew 27. We're going to dive into a passage that actually predates the resurrection. We're going to look at a different place. You know me, I like to change it up. We're going to be in Matthew 27, starting at verse 35. But before we get there, let me set the context for what we're looking at. Jesus has walked the earth now for roughly 33 years. If you're new to the faith, or maybe you're joining us online, and you're just kind of checking out this whole Jesus thing, Jesus walked the earth healing people delivering people from oppression, restoring lives, calling people to repent. And then he started to cross a line with some of the authorities. He started to say things like, the coming of the second kingdom is at hand. God's kingdom is at hand. I am he who you are waiting for. I am the Messiah. And, and, and people started to say, you know what? I really think this guy is the king. I wonder if he's the king that's going to replace the king here in Israel. And that started to stir up people. People were like, yeah, he's our king. Let's go. Now, the Romans didn't like that. There was just one problem. Rome was in control. And they had already installed the lesser king named Herod. Herod was a tyrant. He was a wascal. Nobody liked this guy. He was incredibly paranoid. And he loved, he was put there just to keep Israel under his thumb. Like, you just keep those people in line, and we're going to do, we'll just rule the world. But you keep the, uh, Israel's crazy, all right? So you just do that. You do what we say. He was subservient, and he was incredibly paranoid that people were always trying to take his throne, always trying to stir up trouble. So when Jesus walks on the scene and people are like, hey, woo, we got a new king. king. You don't think he heard those whispers? He started, well, hey, what's going on? It's time to kill this because there's no way Herod and Jesus are going to rule as co-kings. They didn't do that. So he tried to eradicate it. So believe it or not, the Jews got together with the Romans in an unprecedented move. They arrested him and they put him through this sham fake trial. I use that very loosely. In the middle of the night, it was not even legal. They rush him through, and then they convict him, and they say, let's beat him. So they beat him terribly, almost to his death. And then they sentenced him to death, and he had, that's not bad enough. He had to carry his own instrument of death 
up the hill and be nailed to it, the cross, okay? All of that. This is where we pick up the story in verse 20, uh, 35. He says, after they had finished, the soldiers, nailing him to the cross and were waiting for him to die, they killed time by throwing dice for his clothes. Above his head, they posted this criminal charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Along with him, they also crucified two criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And people passing along the road just jeered, shaking their heads in mock lament. Hey, you bragged you could tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. Okay, show your stuff. Come on, save yourself. If you're really God's son, come down from the cross. Do you hear the mocking? It gets worse. Then the high priest, along with all the religion scholars and the leaders, they were right there with them, mixing it up with the rest of them, having a great time poking fun at them. He saved others. <laughs> he can't even save himself. King of Israel, is he? Okay, they let him come down from that cross. Oh, we'll all become believers then. Do you hear the derision? Do you see this intense mocking? We'll all be believers. He was so sure of God. Well, let him rescue his son now if he wants him. He did claim to be God's son, didn't he? Crucifixion was filled with antagonism and mockery and ridicule and disbelief. Even people who didn't believe put that sign to mock him. He's king of the Jews. They didn't even believe it. And it was full of this hatred hurled on him. None of them believed that he was the Messiah. And they missed the whole point of what Jesus was doing. His point wasn't to, to show his authority that he could save himself for crucifixion. His point was to show he could overcome death and buy back the redeemed. That was his whole point. And sometimes we do the same thing. We miss Jesus' point. When we have a pandemic or when things are crazy and we get our minds focused just right here, we take it off of the cross. We take it off of all that God's done. We start thinking, God, why don't you do what I expect you to do? How come you don't respond in this way? And you all know people who still do this. They don't understand why Jesus doesn't do what they expect. God, I'll believe you. I will follow you as long as you do my expectations. As long as you heal this relative. Or I'll believe if you give me that job. Or I'll believe if you end world hunger. Or I'll believe if you just ride it in the sky, then I will give you authority over my heart. But until then, not interested. This isn't anything new. We still have people to this day. This is the same struggle that so many have. We demand Jesus be Jesus on our terms, don't we? I'll believe, or you have a family member you've been praying for. Well, I'll believe if he just did that. Or if God's so good, how come he doesn't do that? Herod wasn't the only one threatened by the authority and kingship of Jesus. People today are threatened by the kingship and the authority of Jesus. He wasn't the only one to struggle with the idea of Jesus being in charge. The truth is, this is still a problem we have. Let me show you what I mean. I've got hidden over here just a little something to try to show us a modern-day illustration of kingship. I have a throne. And it's been said that only one person could sit on the throne of your life. It's been said that he who we allow to reign over our heart is the one we allow to sit on the throne. There's just one problem. The default is ourself. We have to choose to make it somebody else. So by default, every one of us is seated on the throne of our heart. Every one of us, by default, are our reigning king. We are the monarch. There's just one problem with that. If there's no one higher than us, if we are the king of our heart, then we answer to no one higher than us. See, when I live for myself, if I'm the king, then I do what I please. If I'm the king, then I answer to me. If I am the king, then I live for myself. I do what I think is best. I don't consult anyone else. There's no one higher than me. So if I live for myself, you might say that selfishness reigns because I am the one seated on the throne of my life. But there's another option. What if we allow our creator to have his rightful place on the throne of our life? What if he is the one who rightfully gets to sit here, who rightfully has to has that authority to speak to us. See, when he sits here, then we start living for him. And we live not for self, we live for selfless acts. We start to resemble him, we live for others. 
We show grace. We have a life of peace. We have a life of purpose. When he is seated on his proper throne, life takes on a whole different significance, a whole different meaning. He is the one. Now, here's the dilemma. There can only be one king. Long before the great theologian Sean Connery and, and Christopher Lambert and Highlander said there can only be one, God showed the truth of this. I've never even seen this TV show from the 80s, but even I knew this catchphrase was true. There can only be one king. So my question for you, who's it going to be? Maybe you're listening online. Maybe you're driving to some family of members and you're, you're hearing this. You're thinking, I've never made the choice. See, by default, you are the one seated on this throne. You have to choose to get up and to allow the Savior to take his rightful place on the throne. Because there can only be one king. And when he rose from the dead, he proved his authority. He overcame death. Think about this. He was the one. His power, his love for us overcame death and defeated evil. His resurrection is the proof that he is indeed the king over all. So let me say this in another way, because there's a powerful story about the famous artist Gustave Doré. He's the one that gave us such incredible artworks like this one, the Apostle Paul being converted from Saul when he saw the great light from Damascus. We see Moses coming down with the Ten Commandments, seeing all the idolatry and the golden calf and all these things and his anger and his wrath, these incredible artworks. Gustave Doré was a famous man, but he had one issue. When he was traveling in Europe in the late 1800s, he lost his passport. And as he got stopped at the border, he tried to convince all the guards, hey, I am who I say I am. And he says, well, you need to show us proof of that. He says, I don't have any proof. He says, do you not know me? And he says, sir... <laughs> No offense, but do you know how many people come to this border pretending to be somebody they're not just so they can gain access? You don't understand. I am Gustave Doré. I'm the world-famous artist. You have artwork hanging in that cathedral behind you. Okay. If you're really Gustave Doré, prove it. Oh, okay, how? He says, all right, if you're the world-famous artist, he gave him a piece of paper and a pen. He says, I, or pencil. He says, I want you to draw this crowd. Draw that woman that man and that child. He said, done. He grabbed the piece of paper, he, he grabbed the pencil, and it, within seconds, he gave it back to the guard, and the guard was stunned. He had to utterly be convinced, and he was in a second. He looked at it, and he says, oh my goodness. Y'all, do you see what happened here? This is incredible. His work confirmed his word. And just like that, Jesus does the same thing. His work confirms his word. The resurrection confirmed it was true. The people doubted him. They mocked him. It didn't matter because he had the final say. Love would reign. The Lion of Judah would roar again. One of the most famous verses. You don't even have to be in church, and you've heard this. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, what we miss is not only did God send his Son to live, he sent him to die. But not just die to raise again. He wouldn't stay dead. And when we put our faith and our hope and our trust in the finished work of that cross, that is salvation. That saves us from our sin. This is why we celebrate. Think about this. If you're fearful, the very worst thing that can happen to you will not be the last thing that happens to you. The very worst thing you can think of, if you give up your life, Jesus has taken care. He showed us the pathway to victory. When he resurrected with a glorified body, he could walk through walls. He could eat with people. He could say, here, touch me, feel. Your spirit doesn't have holes in his hands or, or a hole in his ribs where I was pierced. Think about this. So after Jesus was resurrected, he gives a final word to his followers, his disciples gathered. And this is the truth behind the Easter story. Look at Matthew 28, starting at verse 18. He says this, And Jesus came and he spoke to them, saying, some authority has been given to me. <laughs> it doesn't say that, does it? It says all, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So here's your job. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're going to be baptizing you again soon. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And get this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus was given all authority on heaven and earth. Didn't matter about the doubts. That's irrelevant. He still proved he was king of the kings. No matter how many mocked him, he wasn't able to rescue just himself. He could rescue you and me 
from our sin. He has the authority, and now he's reigning at his proper place at the right hand of the Father. And he gives us final instruction to his followers, those who claim to be disciples. The Greek word used here is methetes. This is where we are supposed to allow love to reign in us. I want you to look at this word. It's methetes, meaning it's more than just a follower. This is so much deeper. This is supposed to be somebody who is completely devoted to have true rule and dominion over this person's conduct. Think about that. Total sold-out commitment. Not just, oh, I kind of like him, I'm a student, but a sold-out follower. So you know i got to ask on this Easter morning, what about you? Would you consider yourself a mathetes, a sold-out disciple of Christ? Or are you a casual follower? Because there's two different groups. When we allow ourselves to be students, it, is, it begins a lifelong process of, of sanctification where we become more like Jesus, where we learn to be more generous with our lives. We learn to forgive people who treat us horribly. We learn to serve others. Again, this goes back to the throne concept. We learn to, to love others and practice self-control. We learn to be people of peace. When we submit to the love of Jesus, we are compelled to live life like him. It's supposed to change us completely. I'm glad most of you didn't know me before I became a Christian. I was 16 years old, and I was a decent kid, but I, I was a typical Christian as far as I thought because I was basically a good guy, but I didn't know the Savior. I knew about the Savior. I'd gone to church off and on, but I never grasped the fact that my sin had separated me from a holy and a righteous, perfect creator. And one night, living in Alabama, I took a youth trip up to Ridgecrest, North Carolina. It was a Friday night, and I remember hearing for the first time, unless you repent of your sins... Unless you agree with God on the hideousness of your sin, you are separated from him. Unless you repent and turn 180 degrees of walk and allow Christ to invade your world, the Holy Spirit sealing you and say, you take on lordship. Unless you confess him. And I didn't, I'd never heard that. I thought, what do you mean? I'm just a good guy. I go to church. I go do the right things. You know, I give a $5 bill every third week or something. You know, I, 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 and I thought that was it. And when I heard this, all of my excuses fell to the wayside. When I heard that some innocent man took my sin, my punishment, when he didn't deserve it, it made all the sense in the world. He died for me, and now I want to live for him. I want to give him my life. And since that moment, for the next 30 years of following after Christ, being a methetes, it has changed everything. It has made me a better husband. Knowing Jesus has made me a better father. Maybe a better student, maybe a better pastor, maybe a better friend. You see, it changed the whole direction of my life when I got up out of the throne and I allowed him to take his rightful place of authority. What about you? Tonight, there's an incredible show about disciples. It's called The Chosen. Some of you have been watching it and binging it. It is fantastic. It puts real life skin on all the disciples, these true methetes. And you see how they lived and the struggles they went through. And you see the encouragement and how it can be done to be a heart sold out follower of Christ. Tonight, you're going to see a scene with some of these disciples coming to the forefront and the struggles they made. And one of my favorite scenes from the first season was when Mary Magdalene had a 180 degree experience. She said this, she said, all I know is this, I was one way and now I'm completely different. And the thing that happened in between <laughs> was him. It was him. It was Jesus. What about you? Are you changed? Have you had that kind of change? The final truth that we are given by Jesus before he leaves, before he ascends to the Father, is that he will be with us to the very end. This is the hope. This is the good news. You are not an orphan. You are not alone. You are not forgotten about. Hear me. This is for somebody. You're not alone. You're not at the end of your rope. You're not by yourself. If you know the Holy Spirit and he has taken up residence within you, you are a born-again believer. This means no matter what you go through, no matter what you face, you are never alone. So here's what we're going to do, okay? I, I promised we would truncate the service a little bit because I know we got the, the little ones in here. What we like to do, because I see a lot of fresh faces, we just like to stand in a minute. We sing one last song, and we open up the altar for decisions. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead and have our musicians come up, and I want to hit you with the bottom line of what we've looked at. Jesus is the true king over everything. And the way he did it was he proved his authority. He proved his authority 
by the resurrection. The fact that if you go look at his tomb, he's the only one who you will not find bones. He's the only one where there is no body. He's the only one that there's no shrine where you can go and pay homage and you just, it's empty. He rose from the dead, which leads me to the big question for every one of you. Here is your challenge today to answer this single question. Is Jesus the authority in my life? That's my question. Is Jesus the authority in my life? Ask yourself this. Do I see Jesus as the authority in my life? Does his love truly reign over the way I live? If not, today can be the day to make that change. Today can be the day when we allow Jesus to his rightful place, his authority, and take the lead. See, in this room today and listening online, I think there's two, two camps, two groups of people, and every one of us will fall in one of them. Some of us are in the camp like I was, where you were just like me. You'd never really made a decision to let love reign. You've never made a decision to truly follow Jesus. You've known about him. Maybe you were like me and you were skeptical. You were waiting for him to prove himself. And today he has. Today he has shown by the resurrection that he is who he says he is. Or maybe you've been waiting because you didn't want to give up control of your life. You like sitting on the throne of your heart. I get it, man. It's tough to submit to his authority. It means we have to admit we've sinned against God and against others. It means we submit and swallow our pride. That's not easy, especially for us men. Men, we're, we're bad at that. Our pride gets in the way of so many good decisions for the Lord. Today's the day to swallow that and say, you know what? My pride is gone. I see what you did. I see with the pain that you went through and you were innocent. What you did for, for me on the cross. Today is the day you can surrender to the Lordship of Jesus to become a heartfelt disciple. If that's you today, I want to pray for you. In fact, let's just bow where we are. Just tune out the distractions. Close your eyes. If you're at home, just... Make this a, a, a sanctuary of, of worship right where you are. And I want to lead you in a prayer. If God's tugging at your heart and you know he's speaking to you now, I'm just praying just like I did at age 16 when someone was able to pray with me. In your own words, would you just say, Jesus, I confess that I have lived my own way under the authority of myself, and I've done it for far too long. God, I admit, according to your word, that I know that I've sinned. That's, that's not hard to convince me of. I know I've sinned against you and against others, and I'm sorry. And now, Lord, in the quiet of this moment, I ask for your forgiveness. I can't wash away my sin on my own. I can't earn salvation. I can't be good enough. It is all because of you and the finished work you did on the cross. When you cried out, it is finished, it was. God, I confess you as Lord. I welcome your Holy Spirit to come into my life, to take up residence, to sweep me clean, to be my guide. I turn away from my sin and I repent and I believe you died and you rose from the dead and conquered death. You bought us back. Help me to obey you in everything. Lord, you reign on the throne of my life. Thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for not leaving me as, a, as an orphan cast to the side but that you wrote yourself into the story to redeem me today. Thank you for being with me for the rest of my days. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If your heart was engaged and in your own way you meant those words of confession that he is Lord and you are willing to repent of your sin, based on God's word, you are a new creation. This is a similar heartfelt conversion that I had back at Ridgecrest, North Carolina, not even realizing I would live in this state two decades after that. And I see it all come full circle today. If that was you and you prayed that prayer, we rejoice with you. You need to tell somebody. I would love to know and rejoice with you. The next step that Jesus has is you plug into a local church. If that's not here, please plug in somewhere. There's so many awesome churches. Maybe you're out of town. Find a Bible-believing, unapologetically inerrant, Scripture-believing church and plug in. He also says repent and be baptized. If you haven't been baptized, that is the first step to declare I am all in. Jesus himself demonstrated the need. He did that. He was baptized. If it was good enough for the Lord, it's good enough for me. We're going to be doing that in just a couple weeks. We can do it right here in the baptistry. We can even go to the lake. We've done that before. This is a step that we declare to a world. I'm all in. You hear some great words 
as you go under the water, it says buried in the likeness of his death. And as you come out of the water, it says raised to walk in newness of life. Newness of life. That's what we're talking about. When he invades and takes over and becomes Lord. Maybe you need to commit to follow up in believer's baptism. We're going to be doing that in a couple weeks. Just come up and tell me. See, that's the first group of the people that are one option. The other one is the person who's already trusted Jesus, but if they're being honest, they've kind of left some room to fire up those jets to be a little bit more on fire for God, or maybe they've drifted. Maybe that's you, and you kind of feel like, you know what, I feel kind of stale. I get it, especially during this pandemic, man. It is easy to allow those coals to grow colder and colder. Today is your day to recommit, to allow God, the Holy Spirit, to stir up that passion, the passion that drove the Lord to the cross. The resurrection morning is an awesome morning to recommit, to live for him. So in a moment, we'll stand. We're going to sing a final song together. If you've never been here before, we open up the altar for people to come and kneel. This is your time. No one will bother you. You'll see people come and kneel for just 30 seconds. They might just give something to the Lord. There's something special when you kneel before the Father. You might see somebody stay for a minute or two praying for a lost family member. They might be praying for you. Maybe you want to recommit. Say, God, I'm all in. This is your time. This is your year. This is your resurrection Sunday. Make him the Lord on the throne of your life. Whatever God's calling you to do today, just be obedient. Let's stand together. The words will be on the wall. The altar is open. You come now as the Father leads. Just be obedient to him.